thank you for having me here today. It's quite an honor to be here. And to bring you the conference, my mom is pretty impressive. Our talk today is going to be an annual physical therapy coach, the therapeutic exercise for monitoring patients and balance balance patients, and a special on the education service. This is a pretty busy slide, so I'm sorry about that. The most important thing on this whole slide is the very last one. It's in the physical therapy document. If you have any questions that you don't get to answer today or you want to ask, please just email it to me. I have uh, one of my secretaries checks that every day, and she will get that information to me, and I'll try to get this answer to you. But again, it's in the physical therapy. Last, yeah, on this slide, the most important thing here is that my staff and I are trained in integrated osteopathic pain and physical therapy. And that's important for our discussion today and helping our patients with the education service. I have nothing to disclose. <laughs> <laughs> Except I'm in the of the <laughs> The goals of my presentation are to understand why proper posture and body mechanics are important in patient positive patient outcomes. Understanding that combining manual physical therapy and therapeutic exercise are better than just therapeutic exercise or manual therapy or stay along the boundaries. And what you should look for in a physical therapist if you have a connective tissue disorder. Connective tissue. Connective tissue is the most abundant protein in the human body. The collagen provides structural strength of all human tissue. It's basically the glue that holds us together. When muscles, ligaments, organs, and bones are built with effective collagen, they will cause systemic or total body weakness and instability. What does monoclase and aerospanos affect? Or affect your heart? Blood vessel, bone, spine, joints, muscles, ligaments, eyes, lungs, skin, nervous system, stomach, and nervous system. So it encompasses, encompasses everything. Now, from a physiological standpoint, how should our muscles and ligaments work? Typically, our muscles should be off tension all day long and only contract when we want them to. Our ligaments, on the other hand, should always be on tension and supporting our joints. And our monoclonal patients and my hypermobile patients or my PBS patients is backwards. The muscles are always on tension, are tended to stabilize the joints, and the ligaments are off tension because they're too weak and they don't have any stability. So the goal of manual physical therapy is to restore the maximum pain-free movement of the musculoskeletal system and proper postural balance. Results, when the muscle is on tension all day long, it will cause pain. Muscle tightness, muscle spasms, trigger points, and weakness. When your ligaments are off tension, it will cause joint pain, instability, supplications, and or dislocations. So the goal of manual physical therapy, as I said earlier, is to reverse this process. We want to get the muscles off tension, and we want to get the ligaments on tension. Once we accomplish that, we want to add in therapeutic strengthening, stabilization, toning, diavascular, and proprioceptive exercises, and very specific stretching exercises. So, a typical house looks like this. On, on a normal person who doesn't have a connective tissue disorder, this is what they look like. A lot of my EDS patients and monotonous patients come in and say, Well, I look normal. But everybody wants to know what's wrong with me, but they can't see it on my face or on my body. But your house looks like this. Just like us. When a person without a connective tissue disorder, their house is built 16 out of 7, which means it's square. They have a good 2 by 4s good 2 by 6s and a good 2 by 8s However, my mock down patients, my EDS patients, my connective tissue patients, their 2 by 4s 2 by 6s and 2 by 8s Basically, turn on the test. They're weak. And that's why 
why you end up with joint supplications, hypermobility, or joint dislocations, and a lot of joint pain. And that's what it looks like to me when you're in patient, and that's what my patient is telling me to do. So, my foundation is one of my secretaries. I'm five nine five ten. Now, this is about good posture versus bad posture. In this picture, with the twelve pounds, that thin needle weighs one hundred and twenty pounds. Your head weighs ten percent of your body weight. If your head goes forward one inch, it increases the pressure an additional twenty pounds per square inch on your neck. And everybody in this room is sitting with the whole head posture right now. It's increasing the pressure on your neck to 32 pounds of pressure to strength. That's why you end up with headaches. That's why you end up with neck pain. And a lot of my patients complain of their C1 about it. C1 may be the one. If your head goes further than one inch forward, you add an additional 10 pounds of pressure to strength on your neck. And that's 42 pounds of pressure to strength. And a person is 120 pounds. It's a lot of weight for you. So I want to do a little demonstration. Dr. Henson was kind enough to volunteer. <laughs> Let me come down here in front so everybody can see this. And I'm going to need some volunteers from the front. So who's in here? Can everybody see us? No. no. Uh, we'll have to stay up here. Not good. How about now? You still hold the bottom of the cave. Face me if you can do please. The bottom of the cave. Now put it at your head level. The kid that we okay. I'm gonna take these three people right here. Come on up. And I need two more people. That's great. Are you gonna stand behind Dr. Hepson and then come on up? Now before we do anything, let's just go a bit forward. I'll hold it there. I do. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you look, you can see the front of your very close. It's like This is your neck. This is your low back muscles that are working while your head is full. That's why you have pain when you're standing as well. So you're putting a lot of pressure on the muscles in your low back as well as in your neck. You're starting to shake right now, so it's getting a little tense. <laughs> so we're going to bring the head back to you. And you guys can come to one grab one head. That's a muscle. Somebody grab a yellow. If I can break it, you grab a yellow. Speed, you grab a red. Maybe this is a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit Now let the head, let it drop forward. Let it go forward. You see how those muscles and ligaments are overstretching? That's what happens to your neck. When your head is full, and why you end up with headaches. There's a little nerve in the back of your neck that gets pissed off and can give you a headache, as well as the blood vessels. Does that make sense to everybody now why it's important to change your posture? All right, we're going to let it back so we don't snap. <laughs> <laughs> let it go slowly. Make sure you don't put 
So if you want to destroy each other, bring your elbows back and down. Rest your hands on your lap. Now look at your neck. It's pretty straight. Everybody in the room now is going to do a good posture. That simple pitch posture. Your therapist tells you, cut your chin in, lift your head up, get your ears over your shoulders, get your shoulders back, your chest up. That takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of things to remember. I have my patients who will reapply the tendonies when they first come in. And as they bring their arms back, make sure you feel the muscles behind your scapula and your shoulder blades working. Right? So the whole exercise looks like this. And that's what happened after they did the exercise. Their posture improved that dramatically. Now, sitting at the computer. Research information from the internet, Dr. Guru or whatever it is. It drives me crazy because a lot of this stuff is wrong. So, this is the posture that she sits in in the sitting room in the office. This is Ed. He's 6'10. This is what he does. He's a CFO of a big corporation. And that's not good for him to be sitting in a position like that as an executive all day long, particularly since he had an aortic dissection at one time. So that's him just looking forward. You can see his head's way above the computer. He's not able to look. His head is really far forward. His hips are lower than his knees, which is also very bad. So the little simple exercise. Put your hands just underneath your nose. On your maxillary bone, not on your nasal bone. You want to be on the maxillary, just on your nose. And bring your chin, your, 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 your upper lip away from those fingers. That's what a little simple exercise you do. So it looks like this. I don't like you doing it on your lower jaw. Why? Because your mandible is movable. But if you press on that and you're thinking too hot, it'll increase your TMJ pain. So that's why you can't do it. Sorry, here. Welcome. And in Jen's case, she was a little vertically challenged. She's about five feet tall, a little taller. So for her to sit correctly in the chair with her hip higher than her knee, I have to put a little bolster on the floor. And that fixed her posture immediately. <coughs> and you can see the difference between the two. In Ed's case, he's really tall, so his hips were much lower than his knees because he had very long legs. So in this case, I put a pillow in the chair and tilted it so he put his pelvis in a better position for him to sit and fix his neck, fix his legs. He was tall, he was tall from the floor. And your eyes should be about 18 to 19 inches away from the monitor. And in this case, I have a little shelf right here, I can't lift the monitor up. It should be about 18 to 19 inches away, and your eyes should be dead center of the screen. And I'll take away the stress and strain of the legs behind you for the rest of the legs. Particularly for a lot of patients who have high problems. So, review of the literature. Patients doing nothing, exercise alone, manual therapy alone, combination of manual therapy and exercise. If you do nothing, you will not get better. <laughs> you will continue to get worse, eventually. If you do therapeutic exercise alone, irregardless of what it is, as long as it's not a high level one, you will feel a little bit better than doing nothing at all. If you do the exercises correctly, you will feel markedly better than doing the exercise than doing nothing at all. The research also shows that if you do just manual therapy with nothing else, you will feel a little bit better than just therapeutic exercise alone. However, if you combine manual therapy and therapeutic exercise, it was statistically significant that patients overwhelming improvements, pain-wise, and functional ones. So I want to go over some of my treatment techniques, actually, the physical therapy deficits that I look at when I'm looking at patients from a manual therapy standpoint. I'm looking at the joint laxity or instability, muscle weakness from unuse, muscle weakness from muscle spasms, lack of proprioceptive input, poor cardiovascular endurance, and poor muscle endurance. So the next thing the treatment consists of manual therapy, therapeutic core stabilization exercises, joint stabilization exercises, proprioceptive exercises, cardiovascular and muscle, muscular endurance exercises. 
And the different types of structural manual therapy are as following muscle energy, mild fascial release, Jones train, 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 cranial therapy, cranial sacral therapy, fiscal manipulation versus mobilization, and the brain. These are the things that your physical therapist should know if you want that perfusion from a manual therapy standpoint. These are the questions you want to ask. Do you know how to do these techniques? These are extremely beneficial for patients with connective tissue disease. Now, this is just a treatment session. What I did for you was I had a treatment session on a fellow stainless patient and a mom based patient with a back to back with the tissue. So, Michelle, I'm doing a release of her rib cage and thoracic spine. That's the head again. Doing a pelvic floor release. Sacral iliac joint decompression, a thoracic inlet release. That's not nice coming up, man. That's a thoracic inlet release. A highly bone release. A lot of my connective tissue disorder patients have a great difficulty with swallowing and being able to take deep breaths. And I'm sure they're finding that highly bone is suddenly out of alignment. And I correct that by doing this technique. I make sure the patient doesn't talk while they're doing this because your eyes won't be trapped if you can just talk. That's some simple release, but this relaxes the muscles around the head and the neck. And this is getting into some cranial signal crystal therapy. I'm doing some muscle energy for her oxyclip on her C1 and C2. And I also teach my patients if they can't have self correction for their C1, because a lot of my connective tissue patients have a problem with their C1. This is a muscle energy technique to fix her low back, L4, L5. This is patient has a short right leg because the muscle is bad. It's in her sacral reactor dysfunction. These are all muscle energy techniques. I am not going to manipulate them. Just they're pushing up into my hands and I'm doing nice neck contraction as they're exhaling. So they're not going to do that. Now, this is Michelle before I hit the treatment. This is how she looked after. The treatment took 20 to 30 minutes. This is Ed before and after. You see the difference in his height by just looking at him. the curtain. That's in the before the head flash before and after. Before and after. Now, after we get them straightened out, we like to add some gentle exercises. Now, the exercises, we take our time with the patients, because a lot of our patients that have disability and dark acceptances, I want them to exercise as much as possible to get them stronger. When you have a connective tissue disorder, that's not the smartest idea. Because if you overexercise the patient, it's going to cause more inflammation, which is going to cause more pain. And it's going to tighten the muscles down in spasm and make the bones a lot more even more. So we'll start a little slow. I may actually have to do one or two sets of two, just two or three exercises with maybe three or four or five reps. And then we build them up. This is getting into breathing correctly so that he understands how to breathe before he does any exercise. I'm doing a ball screen for the pelvic intro, which is breathing, bridging, and bridging with a ball screen, bridging with a straight leg raise, and you can see this butts up off the table. It's a really high level exercise. That's his wife. <laughs> Let it watch. <laughs> this is a really neat exercise. So we'll tip this exercise to strengthen the little rotators in your back to help you with rotation. So on your hands and knees, you can do one and one feet from the table to the table there, holding this four nice and level, and balancing on his hands and breathing. You can see he has a really restricted upper back that he's doing like a boundary line. We have to work on that one as well. I also use a stick to help him balance 
so that he's staying in the stable while he's exercising. He stands on a bosu wall. That's a platform, but underneath that is a wall. So he has to balance himself while he's staying on the bosu wall, keeping his support nice and strong. Bike, body have monitor on it, with his hands. Upright bike. I'm in front of a mirror, he stops himself doing separate exercises. Balancing. Bridging over the ball. Sitting up over the ball. On top of him, breathing on one of the roof of the room so that he understands it. Bridging over the ball again, high level. Sites and isometric exercises, as Dr. Graydon talked about earlier in his lecture. Michelle is going to call and start off with to make sure that we have the name from um, the curve of neck. We want to make sure that things don't move too much while she's doing the exercise. And maybe we the same thing, you can see it. You can see her stay on the you know, mastoids, she's back in right there. So you just kind of stay. My patients, when I take them out of the neck brace, instead of using their hand right away, I'll have them move their eyes right or left, and I'll automatically kick in the sternal field master, as you can see, she brings her eyes to the left, her right sternal field master, and the right, and vice versa. So it's a nice way of starting the exercises. Then I'll add in the eyes with some hand resistance as she's breathing. This is a minute before, she really exercised, she made a neck brace, the pillow, she really let herself, now she can keep nice and stable.
the physical therapist must understand your progression in rehab is going to be slower, much slower than your non connective tissue disorder patients. If they do not understand that, they will discharge you through it and just try to get rid of them. And that's not appropriate either. They need to find a physical therapy clinic where they can treat you in a private room, particularly if they're doing manual therapy on you or cranial type therapy for your headaches or muscle relaxation techniques, because if they have you on an open gym, where there are 20, 30, 40, or 50 patients going, and there's a lot of noise, and there's a lot of machines banging, you're not going to relax enough to make that treatment helpful or beneficial for you. And that's really, really important. <coughs> Next slide. And then no, you should never, ever have a chiropractor, an osteopath, or a physical therapist do a manipulation of your neck if you have a connective tissue disorder with hypermobility in your neck. That will cause the TIA, baby stroke, the CBA, tumor vascular accident, or a stroke. A dissection, corner syndrome, your eye will get pinned into your dissection in your neck, paralysis, quadriplegia, or even death. Now, when I mean by manipulation, I mean this type of manipulation of the upper foot, where they do a high velocity, Low amplitude motion where they take the heavy position and they move it really quickly. So you can see a character actor, and he or she uses an active gear, and they're just doing it all the time. That is okay. As long as your head is kept in a neutral position and they're not moving your neck around. But you should never, ever have manipulation done to your neck. In Canada, where I have my osteopathic degree, at the time I was there, it was illegal for you to do a neck manipulation. Anyone 65 or older, no matter what your diagnosis was, because cervical manipulations cause one of a million strokes or death on the table that day. I can't stress that point anymore. That's part of our 